Atopic dermatitis, or AD, affects all races and ethnicities, but certain groups have experienced greater social or economic barriers to diagnosis and treatment. The goal of the Moving Towards Equity podcast series is to raise awareness of the challenges, strategies, and resources for moving the needle towards equitable immunology care for all patients and practitioners in all communities. Welcome to the podcast series from the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I am Dr. Payal Gupta, and this is the first of a three-part series entitled Moving Towards Equity, Disparities in Atopic Dermatitis, or AD. In this episode, we will discuss the current evidence of the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic disparities related to atopic dermatitis. Joining me on this episode are Drs. Anil Nanda, and Dr. Marcella Aquino. Dr. Marcella Aquino is an associate professor of pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University and a clinician at Rhode Island Hospital, Hasbro Children's Hospital. Her interests include allergic skin diseases, particularly allergic contact dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, and drug allergy. Dr. Aquino was recently awarded an implementation grant by the ACAAI Foundation looking at multi-level contributing factors to racial and ethnic disparities in urban children with asthma and atopic dermatitis. Dr. Anil Nanda is in private community practice at the Asthma and Allergy Center in Louisville and Flounder Mound, Texas and is a clinical associate professor of medicine at the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Hi, doctors. How are you? Hello. Great. Thanks for having us. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being on. So I'm very excited about this topic. So let's get started. Dr. Aquino, what does the term health disparity mean to you? Why is it important for healthcare professionals to be aware of health disparities in atopic dermatitis? Health disparities or health inequities that may be based on various factors, including race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, sex, age, sexual orientation, and or geographic location. Health disparities affect multiple aspects of care, including access to healthcare providers and medications the quality of care provided, and the patient's quality of life. Atopic dermatitis affects approximately 7% of adults in the United States, and providers need to be aware of the differences of AD prevalence and severity in different racial and ethnic groups. Additionally, atopic dermatitis may manifest differently, and it is important for allergists and dermatologists to be able to recognize atopic dermatitis in people of color. Great. And Dr. Aquino, what groups are most affected by these health disparities in atopic dermatitis? The burden of atopic dermatitis associated with its severity and persistence is disproportionately present in Black, African-American, and Latinx populations in the United States. Furthermore, the optimal management of AD can be particularly challenging for patients and families who face increased stressors related to poverty and urban living. Yes, the stressors can be really intense and can really affect people's health in so many different conditions. And Dr. Aquino, I feel like this seems like a good point in which to define an important term that may help with this discussion. What are social determinants of health? Can you give us a definition? Yes. Social determinants of health are conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Another term I'd like to define is structural racism. Structural racism occurs when racial ethnic groups are denied or have limited access to systems including education, justice, healthcare, housing, and labor or economic opportunities. Language barriers, low health literacy, lack of insurance, less access to specialist care, in the case of atopic dermatitis, dermatology and allergy, neighborhood stressors and difficulties with transportation to access healthcare facilities can all factor into a lower diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And is there a difference in the severity of disease among various populations? Yes, 
Much of our current data, however, I will note, comes from pediatric studies. Black African-American children are more likely to receive a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis than their white counterparts. Black or African-American children and Latinx children are three times more likely to have persistent atopic dermatitis. Studies have demonstrated more impaired quality of life in atopic dermatitis among Black or African-American adults and children. Additionally, higher atopic dermatitis severity scores, including the patient-oriented eczema measure, also called the POEM, the patient-oriented scoring atopic dermatitis measure, or called PO scorad, and the numeric itch severity score were associated with being uninsured, not having full prescription coverage, atopic dermatitis prescriptions being denied by insurers, and costs of atopic dermatitis medications being problematic. However, it is also important to note that certain severity scores, like the SCORAD and the EASY, or the Eczema Area and Severity Index, that include measures of erythema may underestimate severity in atopic dermatitis in people of color, as erythema may not as easily be appreciated. Yes, and with these differences in severity, I assume that healthcare utilization is also different among African American, Black, and Latino populations? That is correct. Urgent care or ED visits are significantly more common among Blacks or African American and Hispanics, those with lower household income, lower education level. In another study, patients who were admitted for atopic dermatitis and had prolonged length of stay during hospitalization were more likely to have non-white race, have the lowest quartile annual household income, and have either Medicaid insurance or nor insurance at all. Yeah, and so Dr. Nanda, do you feel that these differences mentioned by Dr. Aquino are secondary to the condition itself? or may have to do with the availability of specialists in different areas in the country, as Dr. Aquino had mentioned earlier. Oh, absolutely. I I think there's an issue with less specialists and less specialist care. One of the big issues is a lot of specialists, including allergists and dermatologists, they don't accept government health insurance. And so we're working on that as a physician community, taking more insurance among uh, us physicians. But definitely, I think it's the lack of specialty care that's leading to a lot of atopic dermatitis and more severe atopic dermatitis, including hospitalizations, as opposed to outpatient care. And Dr. Nanda, what is the evidence of underdiagnosis of atopic dermatitis in economically disadvantaged groups? First of all, as Dr. Aquino alluded to earlier, you know, there is a higher persistence prevalence and amount of atopic dermatitis in underserved populations, especially in urban areas, for example, in the United States. Uh, but despite this, there's only limited studies addressing disparities in patients with atopic dermatitis. It is estimated that only about 10% of atopic dermatitis studies that included race and ethnicity, they factored these demographics into the results of the study. So the demographics were factored in in many studies. So that's an issue. Studies have shown that more hospitalized patients with atopic dermatitis are patients with low household income, no insurance, or government-assisted insurance. Uh, and these patients typically have less access to routine or outpatient care, as I alluded to earlier, and thus these tend to be underdiagnosed. These are some of the indirect evidence of underdiagnosis of atopic dermatitis in the underserved communities. Yeah, and then, Dr. Nanda, what are some of the causes of underdiagnosis of atopic dermatitis in underserved populations? Sure. You know, healthcare education, it starts at the beginning, right, where we're all trained. Healthcare education is really insufficient with regards to treatment of atopic dermatitis in uh, underserved populations. One study showed that less than 40% of medical resident physicians in primary care believe that their medical school curriculum adequately prepared them to manage skin conditions in underserved populations and in patients of color. In addition, about 47% of dermatologists, about half, really stated their training uh, was inadequate in TN and treating patients of color. Uh, So there needs to be more exposure to medical students, residents, and fellows uh, in training to education and materials specifically on underserved populations, including people of color. And this is a form of representation bias. If you only see certain populations, you're not going to be adequately trained on on other populations. So that's something we need to work on as a physician community. But in addition, there's other biases on the part of healthcare professionals, including us physicians, Implicit bias is one that has garnered more attention recently. 
It is an unconscious bias from preconceived notions about a variety of factors that causes us to make certain associations. And this could be demographic information related to the ethnic background of a patient, their gender, age, sexual orientation, education, or occupation, among others. And also, as I noted above, many underserved patients do not have the opportunity to have a regular health care visit. So that's a big issue. And one other major issue is that atopic dermatitis can present differently in underserved populations or in patients of color. And this will be covered uh, in, in subsequent parts of this podcast. So I actually had the opportunity to interview a patient whose name is Mackenzie, and she is a college student and was seeing a private practice physician and ended up having some issues with the prior auth. And we have a little clip of her talking about her back and forth that she had to do for a little while while she was waiting for the medication to be approved and how she had hoped that there had been a little bit more hand-holding through that entire process. We switched insurances, and then that made it just a bit harder because then I now was having it shipped directly to Arkansas rather than Texas. And then that, I think, delayed it to about two to three months, so that I had to go back and forth again between Texas and Arkansas to have that administered, which is just stressful because at Arkansas, I'm a student, I have a job, and I also have an internship. And so there's not necessarily time to go back and forth, but it was a lot of silence almost in terms of having that shipped here when having to almost reapply for it because I had applied for it in the beginning and I don't necessarily know what happened right then. But there was just a lot of people to talk to who kept sending me to more people to talk to about the same medication process that I had already technically been in. So that was almost a bit confusing just because I thought I had already been signed up and applied to the program in the beginning, but then had to reapply again through, I want to say, like over five different organizations, not including my insurance. So I think patients rely on us to really help navigate that process, which I know takes up a lot of physician time, support staff time, but whatever kind of procedures or even documents we can put together for patients to help them through that process, I think is very important because... I know that Dr. Aquino, you practice mostly in the academic setting, and Dr. Nanda practices mostly in an outpatient clinic setting. And those two settings actually provide totally different experiences, not only for the patient, but also for us as providers. Can you talk about those factors and how they play into patient care a little bit, especially in this setting? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things with with me being in an outpatient practice. I have a solo practice, so I'm the only provider, only physician. So it is a little limiting. You know, I don't have access to a lot of support staff or social work or things of that nature. But one thing I try and do, since it's my own practice, is I try and spend a little more time with patients. I'm not under the time crunch because I try and schedule patients for a little bit longer so I can spend more time and kind of explain to them the different things about their condition and how to help out with their condition, including doing all the office-related things like prior authorizations, guide the, the patient through the different therapies and therapeutic options with their particular insurance that they have. So just trying to spend more time with patients. But Marcella, tell us about your experience. What do you think in the uh, academic center? So I think, of course, that there are pluses and minuses with any environment. Of course, being in academics, there is the advantage that we have hospital interpreters available Many insurances also provide interpreters for the patients when they arrive at their visit. We do have child life to help occupy if there are other children in the room, those other children that may come with the patient. Another advantage, of course, is that we're easily accessible by public transportation. However, in the age of COVID, there are multiple barriers as well. There are multiple checkpoints where you need to come in. Being in an urban setting, parking is always difficult, so getting on time to an appointment may sometimes be difficult. Unfortunately, I do not have the luxury of always having unlimited time when you're in an academic setting. I will say that during COVID times, there were advantages and disadvantages to telehealth. Some patients felt it was easier to speak over the phone. However, when you are discussing atopic dermatitis, it's sometimes difficult 
to assess how the severity by either a phone call and oftentimes video is not the best quality to look at the skin. However, sometimes if patients don't have internet access, then that could be a barrier to a telemedicine visit. Anil, how was your experience during the pandemic? Yeah, and during the pandemic, it was difficult. I actually stayed open for in-person visits through the pandemic. And I looked at it, you know, it just gave me an opportunity to do some public health also, talking about COVID-19, the vaccine and things, all, all of those, those issues that are still here today. But particularly in regards to atopic dermatitis, you know, a lot of patients ask me, am I more at risk of having allergic reactions to the vaccine? You know, I have atopic dermatitis. What do I do? Am I more at risk for getting COVID-19? So I think just being available to, to talk with patients about that is really helpful. With regards to telemedicine, it was okay. I've had a pretty good experience with it, but sometimes, you know, as, as we all go through, right, there's technical issues sometimes. So sometimes it's just easier for me to do a telemedicine audio visit where I just call and talk to the patient over the phone. And that, that's a lot more efficient and a lot more accessible for the patient than I found. So you just do individually whatever works for the patients. We try and do that as physicians. I definitely think that there's pros and cons to each setting. And I personally think that there's lots of advantages and obviously disadvantages for telemedicine. But I think that more and more people are looking at underserved populations and how to make telemedicine a valuable resource in patients that are in underserved settings, in areas where they don't have access to specialists as easily. There really is a great tool within telemedicine to kind of connect patients to specialists. I think it's because Although I agree with you, Marcella, it is obviously hard when you're on a phone visit to do anything related to derm, or the video can oftentimes not be as helpful, but patients can take pictures of their rashes. And oftentimes, even in a regular clinic setting, the patient might come in for a rash that they had two or three weeks ago. And we rely on those pictures for those visits too. So I think there's definitely in the setting of atopic dermatitis, telemedicine can definitely be used in creative ways and definitely can help patients in that underserved population once we think through all of the tech issues and how to make it more equitable. Sure. And what we're doing right now is just amazing. We learn from our patients, but we learn from each other. You know, I didn't have two great colleagues on the phone, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Aquino, and, and seeing how they better treat underserved populations will really help me as a physician and learning to better treat and, and more available options to treat underserved patients, uh, become a better physician. So I appreciate this. Well, thank you for that really great discussion and setting the stage for part two and part three of this very interesting and important podcast series. Thank you, Dr. Aquino. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Really appreciate your time. And thank you to our guests and to our listeners. Please be sure to join us for future episodes on addressing the barriers to diagnosis and improving access to the treatment of atopic dermatitis. For more resources around AD, visit https education.acaai.org backslash disparity. For other interesting episodes from Allergy Talk, please visit college.acaai.org backslash allergy talk. To receive CME credits for this or other eligible Allergy Talk podcasts, visit education.acaai.org backslash allergy talk. I'm Dr. Payal Gupta for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology.